Liels paldies, un līdz ar to mēs esam gatavi aicināt pirmo nākamās sesijas runātāju Pēteri Zilgalvi, Eiropas komisijas finanšu tehnoloģijas darba grupas līdz priekšsēdētāju ar eksploziviem aplausiem, lai ir enerģisks pārējais mirklis, un aicinu arī sūtīt jautājumus gan ar Twitter startniecību, gan ar īziņu vai WhatsApp startniecību. Lūdzu. Labi, liels paldies. Es principā runāšu par industriālo politiku. Mēs Eiropas komisijā digitālās Eiropas programmā ieguldīsim 9,2 miljārdus eiro digitālo tehnoloģiju ieviešanā, bet bez privāto finansējumu mēs nevarēsim mērogot mūsu digitālās inovācijas pasaulē. Tātad, kas ir interesants par finanšu sektoru, par ko es runāšu mazliet šodien, par fintek jomu, ir, ka tas ir ne tikai ekonomiskais sektors, bet tas ir sektors, kas var finansēt citu sektors. Un, zinām, mērā digitālās tehnoloģijās, finanšu sektors ir bijis viens no pirmajiem sektoriem, kas ir ieviesas tās tehnoloģijas. Mēs runājam mazliet par Eiropas komisijas fintek rīcības grupu, kuras esmu līdz priekšsēdātājs. To mēs dibinājam 2016. gadā. Tas bija mūsu viceprezidents Dombrovskis un komisārs Eitingers, kas toreiz bija mans komisārs. Un mēs esam viens no līdz priekšsēdātājiem. Un mums ir ģenerāla direkcijas no visas Eiropas komisijas. Tas atkal ir visiem ir interesi, kā finanšu sektors var finansēt vai nu pētniecību ieviešanu ekonomikā vai enerģētikas joma vai citas jomas. Mēs izskatījām jautājums par inovatīvo regulatoru un uzraudzības darbību. Tās ir tās nuškastas, kas tiek ieviesa daudzās vietās Eiropas Savienībā un arī citur pasaulē. Mēs skatījāmies uz blokķēju, kiberdrošību, data plusmām, data aizsardzību, tās pašas platformas, par ko kas beigas kungs parunāja. Arī par automatizētiem pakalpojumiem, robo advice, kā aizsardzību, Mākslīgais intelekts arī var palīdzēt cilvēkiem ar ieteikumiem, kā ieguldīt savu naudu, arī standartu un sadarbspēju, kā visi tās tehnoloģijas var sadarboties savā starpā, lai vienkāršām pilsonām ieguldītājām tas var būt viegli izmantojams. Iestāds ir arī veikušas novērtējums par tiem saucījumu ICO, arī kā digitāli aktīvi, kas līdz šiem ir bijuši diezgan pretrunīgi ar krāpšanas gadījumiem, neefektivitāti, bet kā tas varētu būt veids, ka var piesaistīt finansējumu jauniem uzņēmumiem un, kā saka, būvēt vairāk mūsu kapitālu tirgu Eiropā. Viens no secinājumiem, kas mums ilgiem gadiem ir bijis, ir, ka viens no iemesam, kāpēc ASV un Čīnā ir veicās labāk ar platformu radīšanu, ir, ka viņiem kapitāli tirgi ir vairāk attīstīti un riks kapitāls ir vairāk attīstīts. Mēs mēģinām darīt visu kaut ko, lai to attīstītu vairāk Eiropā, bet arī, ja mēs varam jaunas tehnoloģijas veidot, kas var būt aizstātot daļai, tas arī liels potenciāls Eiropai. Mērci nodrošināt, lai Eiropas Savinības uzņēmumu ieguldītāji un patērētāji varētu izmantot šīs tehnoloģijas tās priekšrocības taisnīgā un paredzamā sistēmā, lai Eiropa kļūt par līderu, izstrādājot jaunas veids, ka ātri finansēt augošos uzņēmumus. Komisija kopā ar uzraudzības institūcijām, Eiropas Centrālo banku, un finansiālo stabilitātes pakti, kā arī citām starptautiskām standartu noteikšanas iestādēm, turpinās uzraudzīt norises kriptovalūtas un sākotnēji virtuālo monētu piedāvājumu jomā, pamatojoties uz risku, iespēju un piemērojumās regulatīvās sistēmas atbilstības novērtējumu. Un tad tagad mēs arī novērtējām, vai nākošajā komisijā varbūt vajadzēt kādu likumdošanas aktu, pat jums saucinājiem digitāliem aktīviem, visvairāk tos, ko patērētājs var izmantot, ne tikai, lai piesaistīt investīcijas. Tas atkal, lai dot tādu drošāk juridisko pamatu. Droši vien, un tas visprezidents Dombrovskis jau to paziņoja, Eurofai sanāksmē sāksim ar publisko konsultāciju 2020. gadu sākumā. Aiz svarīgi nejaukt blokķējas tehnoloģijas tikai kriptovalūtu, kas ir tikai viens no lietojuma veidiem, 
blockchains varbūt pamat ļoti dažādiem lietotāju programmām, dažādos sektoros, kas var neaprobežoties ar kriptovalodu vai finanšu tehnoloģiju. Un tad tā mēs ejam tālāk, bet mēs domājam, ka gan finanšu sektors bija viens no vadošiem ieviešot blokķēžu iespējas, kā arī IKT, nu arī agrāk. Un tātad varam to izmantot gan saistībā ar maksājumiem, vērtspapīriem, noguldījumiem, aizdevumiem, kapitālu piesaisti, ieguldījumu pārvaldībai, tirgas nodrošināšanu tirdziniecību un pēc tirdziniecību, kā arī tirdziniecības finansēšana un zināšana, piemēram, regulatora tehnoloģijas Regtek. Rītības plānā mēs jau redzam, ka tas varētu būt viena no galvenajām tehnoloģijām arī finanša pakalpojuma infrastruktūrā nākotnē, decentralizētā vai arī centralizētā ar atļaujām. Un arī mēs esam veikuši pasākums, lai ieviest Eiropas Savienības blokķēdu iniciatīvu, izveidojot ES blokķēdu novērošanas centru un forumu, un tur ir arī tas Twitter konts, kur jūs varat viņus atrast. Viņiem ir kādi desmit akademiskie raksti par blokķēdu un datu aizsardzību, piemēram, blokķēdu un inovācijām, blokķēdu un finanšu sektoru. Un... Tālāk mēs arī esam izveidojuši saikni ar Starptautiskā standardizācijas organizāciju 370. tehnisko komiteju blokķēžu un sadalītās virsgrāmatas tehnoloģiju jomā. Un mēs esam arī aicināti uzņemties uzņemtu vadību Eiropas standardizācijas organizācijās, tā kā SEN, SENELEC un ETSI arī, lai blokķēdu standartus izstrādāt un lai mūsu uzņēmumu var pamatoties uz sadarba spēju veikt un piedāvāt jaunas risinājums. Un tad es pabeigšu ar šo slaidu, un kur mums mērķis ir, lai Eiropa būtu vadībā pasaules līmenī blokķēdu tehnoloģijās, Mums ir kopīgā politiskā vīzija ir Eiropas blokķēdas deklarācija, ko parakstīja tagad būs 30 Eiropas valsts, Horvātija parakstīs tuvākā nedēļas laikā. Mums ir visas 28 Eiropas savienības dalību valsts un vēl Lichtenstein un Norvēģija, kas strādā kopā mums. Un mēs kopā ar šīm valstīm izveidojam Eiropas blokķēdas pakalpojumu infrastruktūru. Tā ir infrastruktūra, kas tiks ieviest jau šogad uz gada beigām. Paziņosim kopā Eiropas Savienības dalību valsts ziņas par pievienoto vērtības nodokļu un muita akcijas nodokļam citām Eiropas Savienības dalību valstīm. Tas taupīs apmēram 30 līdz 70 procentu no izdevumiem šitajā regulatora ziņošanā. Tas notiks daudz ātrāk, un tas arī būs decentralizētā pārbaldība, kas ļoti atbilst Eiropas Savienības politiku, dati paliek tajās valstīs un tiek saņemt ar, kā saka, blokķēdas palīdzību visās citās dalību valstīs. Arī revīzijas ties, drīz publicēs audit dokumentus, kas vajadzētu būt publiski pieejami blokķēdē, un tuvākā nākotnē arī ieviesīsim diplomu certificēšanu, universitātes diplomas, un arī identitāti, decentralizēto identitāti uz blokķēdu. Tagad arī ir publiskā privātā partnerība, Daļa no jums zina tādu ICANN, kas principā ir viens no veidiem, kā internet tiek pārvaldīts. Tas ir Pledore, Kalifornijā, zem Kalifornijas likumdošana. Tagad mēs kopā, mana komisāra, kopā ar privāto sektoru Eiropā, ASV, Japānā un Čīnā, ir dibinājusi starptautisko organizāciju, kas pārvaldīs blokķēdas standartus un sadarbu spēju. Un tā organizācija būs Eiropas Savienības likumdošana, viņa ir dibināta Briselē un ir Beģijā. Un tur būs starptautiskā pasaules kongres šogad novembrī Malagā, Spānijā, tagad visi, kas grib piedalīties, tur var piedalīties. Mēs esam kā Eiropas komisija valdības padomnieku grupā, kopā ar pasaules banku, OECD, starptautiskā valodas fonda, Eiropas centrālā banka, Amerikas uzraudzības iestādes, Japānas centrālā banka, arī droši vien būs Brazilijas centrālā banka un citi. 
mēs savienojam Eiropas un pasaules pieredzes, tā ir tā blokķēdes, tas ir tas blokķēdes novērošanas centrs, EU blokķēn, ko jūs varat to atrast Twitterī un internetā, un mēs investējam pētniecībā inovācijās un jaunuzņēmumos. Es minēju, ka ir digitālās Eiropas programma, kur būs 9,2 miljardi, 500 miljoni būs digitālām prasmēm, par ko mēs dzirdējām, un mēs komisijā arī uzskatam to par ļoti lielu un ļoti svarīgu vajadzību. Tās darba vietas būs vēl un vēl, bet vai mums būs cilvēki ne tikai Latvijā vai citur, kas varēs tās darba vietas ieņemt. Es nesen biju runātais kopā ar OECD direktoru Consensus, kas ir lielākā plasaules blokķēdes konferences New Yorkā, un New Yorks ekonomiskās attīstības organizācija, kas tā kā Finanses ministrī New Yorks pilsētāji, teica, ka viņiem blokķēdu darba piedāvājumi ir gājuši uz augšu 400%, un 1 miljārdus dolāru ir ieguldīt šo gadu blokķēdē tur. Tātad tās darba vietas ir, uzņēmuma plauksts un iespējas ir, protams, ne tikai tajā tehnoloģijā. Tad es stāstīšu tālāk, arī tieši manā nodaļā mēs esam attīstījuši investīciju fondu par mākslīgo intelektu un blokķēdu. Tie ir tās investīcijas varbūt vai no mākslīgā intelektā vai blokķēdē, vai kur abi ir kopā no tādā decentralizētā mākslīgo intelektu pielietojumā, un mums būs simts miljonus eiro, ko mēs varēsim sākt investēt no caur Eiropas investīciju fondu jau nākošu gadu. Tad cerēsim, ka Latvijas uzņēmumi pieteiksies arī uz to un arī uzņēmumi no citām balstīs valstīm. Pa standartiem es mazliet runāju, ka mēs mēģinām nodrošināt, ka kur vajag standarts, ka tur ir, lai nevajag izgudrot katru reizi, kad ir publiskais iepirkums, kādu piedāvājumu vajag, un prasmēs mēs arī ieguldīsim. Un ar to, es domāju, tas ir varbūt mans pārskats par to, ko mēs daram. Industriālā politika digitālajā jomā, un mēs ļoti gribam turpināt sadarboties ar dalību valstīm. Es minēju, ka mēs sadarbojamies cieši un ik dažos nedaļos tieši tajā Eiropas blokķētas partnerībā, bet arī saistībā ar investīcijām, saistībā ar pētniecības jautājumiem un arī nākošajā komisijas un parlamentu laikā ar jauniem varbūt likumdošanas aptiem, kas dos vairākas inovatīvas iespējas mūsu uzņēmējiem un citiem inovatoriem. Paldies, paldies, Zildokungs. Viens jautājums jums arī tāds krietni ātars. Ja mēs paragumies, jūs labi aprakstījāt no komisijas perspektīvas šo te blokķēdes, principā politikas un vīzijas attīstību un redzējumu. Ja mēs paraugamies tādā laika līnijā un sūdām skaidru vēstījumu Latvijā, piemēram, strādājošam valsts pārvaldes darbiniekam, piemēram, valsts ieņem dienestā. Un no kurā brīdī blokķēde kļūs par realitāti jūsu skatījumā Latvijā? Kurā brīdī tas varētu būt pēc no kāds... Varbūt kāds konkrēts gads, lai tas cilvēks zina, kā tas palika? Man jāsaka, ka tagad es atzīšu mazliet savas nezināšanas, tāpēc, ka es nevarēju ierasties. Bet ekonomikas ministri rīkoja Hakatonu aprēļu sākumā tieši par kases aparātiem un blokķēdu. Un, cik es saprotu, rezultāts bija Latvijas uzņēmums uzvarēja ar labāko piedāvājumu, bet viņiem bija pieteikušies kā arī 87 komandas no visas pasaules, un, ka tieši tais risinājums varbūt tuvākajā laikā varēt ieviest saistībā ar kases aparātu ziņām, ziņošanu, blokķēdē vid. Un tad varbūt valsts sekretārs Eglīts varēs kaut ko mazliet stāstīt par to, tāpēc, ka es samērā bieži esmu Latvijā, bet diemžēl nevar atbraukt uz visiem pasākumiem, tāpēc, ka es atpalu par 28. dalībalstīm. Bet man iepriecināja šitās ziņas, un es ceru, un varbūt kāds no ekonomikas ministrijas varēs stāstīt vairāk par to šodien. Bet, principā, tas ir tagad ko es stāstīju par nodokļu jomu, tas ir mūsu pusē DG taksot, bet tie, kas atbild par nodokļiem, tātad vidu un varbūt kādu ministriju Latvijā, ziņos tos nodokļus, pievienot to vērtību, tā informācija, ko jādal tagad starp dalību valstīm un komisiju, tas notiks 
šogad es beigām vai nākoši gadu. Tā tehnoloģija vēl, nu, tā tehnoloģija nekad nevarēs darīt viss, tur bija mazliet tā, nu, pārāk liela publicitāte, ka tas ir atrasinājums visam, tas pilnīgi nav, bet tā ir tehnoloģija, ko var izmantot, lai decentralizētu dalīt, darīt lietas, ko nevar, un varbūt politiski nevajag centralizēt. Un tad ar šitādu ziņošanu regtēku, arī kā mēs varam labāk izmantot datus mākslīgā intelektā, tātad, jā, Latvijā būs tas open data, atvērtie dati, varbūt dalīties ar datiem no citām valstīm, arī saņemt. Mēs varēsim izmantot, teiksim, blockchain sistēmu, lai to, lai tā sadarboties. Paldies, lieliski iemetāt arī Ankuri Bāķi, ekonomikas ministrijas pārstāvim, viņš ir pieāķēts un būs spiešanās. Paldies! Cerēsim, ka viņi varēs stāstīt mazliet vairāk par to. Paldies, jā. Paldies, liels! Ladies and gentlemen, now I'm deeply honored and happy, in fact, to invite here on the stage our neighbor country perspective, Lithuanian perspective, Elius Čivilis, who is a... Vice Minister of Economics in uh, Digital Questions. So please welcome with applause, uh, like in the Eurovision, 12 points goes to Lithuania. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I really feel privileged to be here in front of you because finally I have my 20 minutes of glory where I can really say what I think about uh, Latvia. On many occasions I meet Edmunds, but he never listens to me. He just comes up with many ideas uh, with many uh, discussion points, but he never asked what I really think about Latvia. So now it's my uh, time to do that. So I'll be talking about really uh, the outlook or how we see what's happening in Latvia, and I will come with very personalized uh, offers on how it could be done in, uh, in the future. Um, yeah, and as I was introduced, I'm Brelukas, so uh, I really wish all the best uh, to, to the neighbor. But before I start, I would like, you know, um, make a confession. My problem is, you know, that I never had a TV at home, and I don't have it even now. And my problem is that whenever I go to somewhere in the public space where there is a TV, I really can't, you know, control myself because all my focus is the two, two TV. <laughs> so last time, I've seen it like a couple of days ago, and I was uh, watching CNN. And I was really impressed on what's happening in the world. So there are so many uh, crises, so many wars, so many important things. And you know, there are so many big news to be told, but all of a sudden between those news, they start telling you about something, you know, you don't really get, hey, what is this? I mean, you were just now telling me about the crisis, and all of a sudden you're telling me this new. And then I tried, you know, to see where it comes from. And even now, traveling to Riga, I double-checked if this is what's really happening. I went to, you know, TripAdvisor, and I checked, you know, what are the best monuments I have to visit in Riga. And apparently, the first one is like, oh, very serious, but then the second one, Jesus. I mean, why they are so diverse, you know? So I, I did this a short investigation. So why it's so that between those very serious things, we also have those really strange ones. And I did a quick research in the internet, so I started with assumptions that it has to be something about mental abilities. And of course, I came up with Carl Jung, which is the beginner of all those modern psychology uh, uh, science, and he says that we basically have two uh, functions of ourselves. So basically, rational part and irrational part. And apparently, uh, this was picked up by uh, Roger Sperry, which made a physical exercise on the cats. I won't be telling you that nasty research he did with the cats, but basically he proved that our brains are split and they are doing different functions. And where we get this very popular right and left brain uh, theory around that left side of the brain is responsible for the logic and those important things, numbers and everything was serious, and then we have the right side which is you know, about creativity, about the soft things, about the uh, uh, Bieber and uh, Beyonce and all other beautiful things in this world. So, uh, surfing dogs and skydiving cats are apparently as much important as the GDP of the Latvia. <laughs> so, my takeaway of this is that first, we as a people are very unique. So is Latvia as a country. Second, 
it doesn't mean that if we are good at numbers, we can, you know, sing. It means that we can build on our strengths and we can train our weaknesses. So that's applicable to Latvia as well. And finally, logic and emotion are equally important. So in other words, it's not about only money and, you know, how much investment we put, but also on how emotionally and how culturally we get engaged into what's happening. But, I mean, that's it with introduction. Let's go to the serious questions. And my question is, do you really want to be the best in Baltics? <laughs> do you want to beat us in basketball, yes or no? Yes. Yes. You see, the problem is that it's not about beating us. It's about you getting fit. Why? Because take a look into the uh, GDP of our region, right? I mean, we are doing extremely bad, so to speak, compared to the countries around us. So if you will beat us in basketball or you will beat us in the economy GDP, will it going to be good enough? I don't think so. I don't think so because, as you see, this gap is basically increasing. And whatever we do today, we can continue on doing the same. We can do it faster. We can do it like uh, uh, we can jump higher. We can hire more people. We can do everything, you know, much more intense, but most probably it won't, you know, create the innovation or it won't create something new. We will just continue on doing the same, but we're just going to do uh, it much faster. So basically the gap between the Nordics and Baltics is, you know, becoming a split. And it's really important for us now to act on this. Um, if we look to the Nordics, what do they say about the future? And this is very much relates to what OCD does. They do not go into very deep research, but there is one picture explaining that they admit that something is happening with our economies. And those things they declare as being the structure of the economy being changed. And uh, very soon data and AI will create much more value than they have in the past, created with the traditional services and production. Uh, of course, there are many, many researchers, but one of them, I just comment that this digital economy of the Oxford University uh, says that in very soon, in just five years, will be uh, almost 25% of the total global economy, right? So we instantly back home did the exercise trying to understand where we are in the country uh, with those global measures, and we in Lithuania did the digital economy calculation. I haven't seen the numbers of, on Latvia, but I assume it should be very similar to this. So what we have found that until now, we don't have it explicit uh, in our statistical department, it's just what we did in our ministry, and we came up that our digital economy is basically the fourth sector, and it grows almost 40% uh, without telecommunications. Why without telecommunications? Because they are already mature, and you don't have more users than you have, so it's basically up to its limits, but if you take a look, uh, take it out, it grows really rapidly over the last years. So most probably that's happening also with Latvia. So my question, what's your ambition? Is it really beating us in basketball? No, I don't think so. I mean, you're playing this global role, global game, and it's not about, you know, us locally doing something. This is about setting the Latvian ambition. And this ambition, it shouldn't be, you know, constrained with the past. It should be way forward. Let me remind you, I mean, guys, you were the only country from this region who had colonies. I mean, you were brave enough in 17th century to sit to the ship, to the wooden ship, go into another part of the world and say, hey, guys, now bring your gold to us because we are now ruling this island. I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, why can't you repeat that in digital age? I think that's possible. So talking about this uh, legacy world that was in analog with the, you know, paper maps that you use to sail across the ocean. Uh, we came to the electronic era where our neighbors Estonians are very proud of being e-Estonia. But the problem is that it's also a legacy now because now we are entering into the digital world. And the difference between the digital world and electronic world, I will explain you shortly. But I will also get back to the, one of the researches that was done by IBM, and I like it because we keep on asking the same questions all the time for many, many years. And this question is, how important, what are the most important external forces that impact your business in the next two, three years? And for many years, it was technology. 
but now it says market. What that means, market? Market means that the environment is much more important than technologies. In other words, technologies are mature and they are known that well that they won't make that big disruption because it's already not about the technologies. It's about what we do with those technologies. So the digital transformation in essence is basically you know, having those isolated units that were in the past and what you have in Latvia them being, you know, just connected to the extent that they were forced to by law or by, uh, I don't know, common service or uh, agreement, having different uh, value creation, and now we are going into absolutely new models. And we've seen many industries being uh, transformed to this new way of uh, collaborating in, so to speak, digital platforms, where you have traditional banks cooperating with the startups, cooperating with their suppliers, with their customers, and it's now one ecosystem. And this one ecosystem, it's scalable. You can plug in, plug out. I mean, you can connect to the world, you can disconnect. I mean, it's a different way of doing things. You don't have this legacy. You don't have to think of how it was in the past. You have to think on how it will be in the future. So then you have this huge transformation, and it was already mentioned today. You have like a big bear running into you, right? Like from east. So what do you do? You either, you know, oh, I'm, away. I'm afraid I'm running away, or you can really, hey, come on. I mean, I'm Latvian. I have my ambition. I was in Caribbeans. Why can't I do that in digital world as well? And so my second point here is, you see, you don't have to wait someone to create a solution and you will buy it. It's not about, you know, we have a common uh, history together, right? We had a moment when someone else was taking decisions of us, of how many hospitals we have to have, what type of work we can to work. I mean, I don't think we like that because we want to take control of our future. So I think you've showed it in many places that it's up to your leadership, it's up to you, not Americans, not EU, not anyone else to drive yourself up front. So, uh, you know, just like on artificial intelligence, now this topic is like number one all over the globe in the internet, and the OCD uh, on, on one of the reports says that it will create like enormous amount of additional value to the global economy, just for your reference, uh, Chinese uh, GDP, it's uh, 10.8, I think. So it's basically creating another China just with one technology. At the same time, it creates a lot of, lot of opportunities, but it also creates a lot of, lot of risk. Uh, in this report, there, I haven't found Latvia, but I've seen us and many other countries similar to, to Latvia that are very exposed to this technology in being shifted in the market, uh, labor market. So on one hand, I mean, we've seen those transformations already a lot. I mean, we've seen uh, horses being replaced by cars. We've seen, you know, uh, I don't know, pigeons replaced by telegraphs. And I've never seen anyone willing, you know, to roll back the technology. It's just a question, how do you set the ground for it? And uh, historically looking, every, you know, technology that destroys the job, it creates five new. On AI specifically, there are many opinions, but one of those from economic uh, forum, it says that it will create more jobs than it will lose. So here it's not about that I want, you know, to scare or say what is already known. I want to say that these are exactly the right moments to act. And now, finally, I can tell you on what I think Latvia could do. I mean, you do a lot of stuff, and, but I would recommend continuing on this. So number one, build the digitized ecosystems. So FinTech, legal tech, I mean, inspire every ministry to run their own roadmap of digitization. If you can do that politically, make it to do, you know, through the public, make, you know, Everyone be the part of disruption. Do not wait until someone else comes and disrupts you. Second, focus on creative future. It's, you see, you will never ever meet, you know, the cap capabilities of India in programming. You might be the best programmers in the world. That's fantastic. But you are what? 200,000 programmers in the country? In India, they have 1.6 million programmers graduated every year. So even if they are not that smart, but in two years we have a population of programmers more than the whole country. 
So it's not about, you know, being faster or being smarter program. It's about, you know, designing the future. And if you think about the future of education, the uh, gaming industry, which is now booming a lot because of the serious gaming, because of the virtual reality, I mean, those industries where I think the future is for Latvia, especially you have a good uh, track record of the uh, culture. I mean, dances, music, I mean, it's, it's part of Latvia. Yeah, and then expand all connected infrastructure. I do not, I mean, I appreciate a lot your internet, that's fantastic, but it's not about it alone. It's also about the new uh, technologies that you're leading on 5G now with initiative. I mean, we really like being poked by Latvians. Hey, when are you planning with your plans? Uh, but it's about, you know, having this last mile, having connected every single citizen by default. It's not having a good infrastructure, but having connected people. Also think of, you know, IoT and many other, you know, connectivity types. And finally, democratize AI. I mean, I would not, I mean, you are great in this area. I've seen many good examples from Latvia, but think of it not being just par part of the business or just part of the public sector. It must be part of Latvia. So in other words, it should not be concentrated in one hand. And finally, focus on society journey. Do not scare the people on the digital skills. When you say digital skills, everyone thinks about programming. I mean, it's not about programming. Very soon, in the next five years, we won't be needing to write the code because the AI will be writing the code. It's not about the code itself. It's about the people being comfortable with what's happening. And my personal experience is, uh, then we talk about the digital skills. There is one mistake that everyone shows marketing presentations on what can be done. So. AI can be used to spy you. AI can be used, you know, to track you. And then they show, you know, different screens. It, no, no, I mean, do not show that. You rather explain what AI is, what it does, how it makes, you know, the decisions. I mean, you better focus on the principles and concepts. And this is not about programming. Yeah, so all together, I mean, looking for inspiration across Latvia, you, you find them so many. And of course, that's also in your national sport. If you think about ice hockey, it's not that sticks or, you know, the gates that defends uh, the opponent. It's about yourself playing. You just use the instruments. So I would recommend you really do the same as you do in those areas and you will be successful. So Paul Dias and uh, talk to you during the coffee break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Elias, a uh, very quick question. What's the uh, ambition of Lithuania? If you well, nowadays I think it's not to get lost by Latvians. So we're trying <laughs> you know, to follow the pace. You're setting really hard. So we're excited. But uh, <clears throat> it's a partly joke, partly reality. Today we did a great thing. We excluded Estonia from this conference. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, one more time applause. Elias, thank, thank you. you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we are continuing with the uh, with perspective of Microsoft uh, on the region, Central and Eastern Europe. We have a chief of this region, Christophidis Evangelos. Please, with applause. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my name is uh, Evangelis Christophidis. I'm the government uh, lead for uh, Central Eastern Europe. And um, I, I have a presentation to, 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 actually, to actually share. To actually share. P point it up to the guard. Yeah. Really? <laughs> it shouldn't. No, that's the second slide. Okay. But, but before, before I, I was listening at the sessions and I got inspired to share very short, some, some very short stories. Why? Because first of all, I'm, I'm working with government officials, state-owned enterprises, um, NGOs across 33 countries. That's the first thing. And the second thing is my job within Microsoft and Microsoft, we're actually engaging from the start to the end. So when we're engaging in, in a journey in a partnership with, uh, with a government or a, or a customer, we're working together on the strategy side, but then we don't throw a document and, 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 and leave. We stay there and we implement it and, and, and we take the heat. So we have some major failures as well. Uh, to, to talk about. So before, before going into the digital transformation story, I, I was first, I wanted to address this fear uh, thing that you mentioned in the morning um, we, with one very, very, very short one. 
Uh, I was recently in an event, a uh, very prestigious event, uh, presenting about artificial intelligence. And uh, one of, of the officials, uh, the, the discussion was about ethics mainly from the officials, about the responsibility on how we are actually moving forward in artificial intelligence. And one of the officials actually mentioned this example from China about this robot um, doing judgments in, in, in a court, taking, taking the, uh, the decisions. Um, and, and actually that intrigued me. I mean, uh, initially from, from my point of view, as a person, I don't want to be judged by a robot. You see, I mean, that's, that's something that we, we think twice and three times before going into that direction. So I really looked into that. And, and the interesting thing I, I, I found was that in that specific country and in that specific court, before the robot, forget the AI story. The condemned rate was 99.6 percent. So, the, the the essence of the discussion is not about the technology here; it was about the regime. It was about what is happening in this country. Technology is doing what we ask it to do. So that being mentioned alone, a robot making the decision and deciding on 99 percent it really needs to, to come back to, to, to the roots of the thing, to make us understand why and what is happening at, at the specific place we are in the specific time. So, so that's, that's, that's the first example. The second example has to do with, with clarity. The minister this morning mentioned this, this very interesting point that we want to be, to, to, to start out, to be the second in something, you know, to have, a, to, to have clarity. And, and for me it's very important because recently I was with again with a very senior government official in a country and we were discussing about some very advanced technologies that they wanted to implement. We could bring the resources, we could bring the firepower as Microsoft to do that change and we, we agreed. I mean he liked a lot our approach, the idea. Uh, he wanted to leapfrog. He told me I want to leapfrog. I want to be the first to, 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 to drive this big time forward. And I said yes. And then I went into his staff to discuss the next forward, and his staff asked me for references. They asked me for, okay, show me the implementation in another two or three or four countries. And I said, you know, either you want to leapfrog, and you made the decision to go forward, and I will be with you all the way, and you need to know what that means, or you want to do something that has been done already. We need to, to create some kind of clarity, and that's a process. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not looking here for, you know, the, the, the brightness, um, uh, some kind of, uh, I saw Albert Einstein there. It's not about that. It's about taking the process to think why and what. And then the last example, which was uh, very interesting uh, uh, by listening to the, to the previous speakers, has to do with, with what we design today for tomorrow. Actually, uh, your, your speech was, was really putting me into that mode uh, of, of how do we look at the future of what we build in digital transformation um, space. In the following sense, recently when I'm, I'm actually visiting uh, government officials, in the same time I'm visiting incubation centers, startups, I'm talking to 17, 16, 18 year olds that are, are creating their startups a lot. I'm doing that intentionally, it's a part of my job, but also it's a part of me. And the, the very interesting thing is, in the morning I'm the, the, in the discussion with the minister, and in the afternoon I'm talking to the young people. And what I realize is that what I was discussing in the morning is not really what will serve the afternoon discussion. And then we have to go back to the drawing board because the young people who are native they are the true generation of native, is they're actually far above and ahead of us. And we that we design, even at European Union level, the officials that design the policies and the strategies and the regulations, they need to take that into consideration. We at Microsoft, we have to rethink. And you see that as you work with the youngsters. So, I, I wanted to share these as personal stories that inspired me from, from what I heard from, from today. From, from, from my point of view, the digital transformation is connected and needs to be connected to the imperatives. And it needs to be connected in, in, in which sense? In the sense that the, the, the imperatives, the priorities are so many and so interconnected that 
actually we, we, we need to redesign the way we are approaching. We need to have governments to be agile and to create new paradigms of operation. You cannot take and just fix things. We need to go on the design board. And that's what is required when we're talking about topics like the innovation and the productivity. We see a lot of pressure in the productivity across Central Eastern Europe. It is the GDP essentially, but if you drill it down, it's about productivity. It's what, what, how, how we make the, 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 um, the machine more productive. Eventually, it's how we are, we are combining the technologies, how we are merging technologies together with processes and operations. And, and eventually, is the disruption of jobs. On my discussions on artificial intelligence, and given that I also have the role within Microsoft, I'm the AI ethics champion for Central Eastern Europe. Um, I have that role as well. I have a huge um, um, discussion when I'm going across Central Eastern Europe on, on, on how the jobs will be impacted. And it goes down to simplistic questions. Not simple, simplistic, I mean the word. So eventually, we need to understand under, in this environment how does transformation and eventually digital transformation has a meaning across all the government sectors. We need to run across the government to look at how it will intersect and not create new silos of technology and transformation. And digital transformation has that kind of power. For us, the digital transformation is also to be people-centric. It has to do with, number one, how we empower the government employees, how we empower them to collaborate better, how we empower them to feel better about their jobs and eventually to provide better services. How we bring the transformation to the citizens and how we give them true value. And eventually is how we improve the operations of the government, how we make it more effective, more efficient, how we transform the entire service cycle to have it more fair and more open. That's a key component of the digital transformation, be people-centric and really focus around how we transform in, with that in our mind at the strategic level. The second component is technology. And technology, as very well heard, and as you very correctly, you, you just mentioned in your uh, presentation, for me, the, the discussion I'm having uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking to, to governments is technology can do almost everything, almost everything. What we can do with the um, IoT advances and, and all the data that, that we can import using Internet of Things, the, what we can actually do with the data themselves and how we can actually disseminate the information and, and, and distribute the information. The advances we have done and the strides in artificial intelligence and uh, in, in, in cognitive areas and of course blockchain as it was mentioned to disrupt the, the cost structures eventually to be able to make things go faster. We're not there yet but we will be very soon I think to make things go faster with blockchain. And then last but not least the investments. Microsoft we do huge investment on security how we secure this environment. I think the technology is, is really making advances which are unbelievable. When we go to, to, to our briefings in, 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 the, in the US, we really stay amazed on the things that the teams in engineering and research are actually doing and what, how fast they can go from research to production. Breaking these two together is important. It's important to actually create what we call a digital feedback loop. Connecting the citizens' priorities, the empowerment of the employees, the improvement of the operations, as well as the entire transformation, connecting to the data and intelligence which is today available, and in that respect, be able to receive signals and improve the process. That type of thinking and mentality, that type of connection is necessary to becoming truly digitally transformed. And that connection is what makes things really happen.
There are a few countries in that path. I, I just chose four. Uh, and of course, I wanted to mention about Latvia because in Latvia we know and we, we actively work and we're present in, in, in the shaping of the, the skills, the strategy, um, innovation. For us, it's, it's really important how Latvia is advancing and moving fast forward into the digital transformation area. Another interesting example I brought up there is Malta. Malta is an island, it's 80 kilometers, 400,000 people. Um, the, the esteemed colleague, I think, from OECD mentioned about, have you th would you think the government being a platform of providing services even more profitable and better providing services than a business, private business? That's what they do, these guys. That's what they're setting up. Uh, in terms of contribution to GDP, um, just to be very clear, the number one contribution in the GDP of New Zealand is the ICT innovation sector. It's not dairy, it's not tourism, it's not films. And they're doing this with a di digitally created strategy that they pursue across all government sectors. And then Denmark, you know, these guys are number one. For, for many, many, many reasons they have advanced, but I think I, I won't go into that because you have already studied the case in the, in the Nordic side. What is, however, common in, in these four countries among a few others? These four countries are small countries. I didn't come here to show you what they do in the US and UK and France. As the productivities go down, the investments are suffering. As the, 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 the populations are aging, the big guys are reacting and they are hitting hard and bad on the smaller ones. And there is one way that the small countries can actually become competitive, being the top 10 and top 20s of the global competitiveness, among other things, and that's the way. The approach should be simple, and I'm, I'm always in favor of simplicity. It's about a simple strategy with KPIs, with KPIs. That's the first thing. Then it's about the platforms, common IT platforms across governments. You can't be going into different distinct directions. The third one, which is very, very important, is about standards, where we see standards created in a common way, in a common approach, it definitely creates an advantage. It really facilitates things. It makes the digital transformation flow. And we come down to the regulation. The regulation starting from the European Union side down to, to, to the countryside with a continuous loop. We know that today European Union, and we actively participate in, in this process, is, is doing strides into the digital transformation in, in the artificial intelligence area, in the blockchain area. So this is, this is a, exactly what, what we need. Last but not least, we need to start. Incubating pilots is on the slide, which is the beautiful word. Failing cheap is the American word for the same thing. We need to go and do things. If we think about it too much, it doesn't work. And that's a big part of what companies like us, we are doing and should be doing and helping governments to do. Go in, fail cheap, do it quickly contribute ourselves in that effort, and also contributing in the digital sk skill set, which is extremely important in that process. Digital transformation is, is one of the components. The second component has to do with digital responsibility and go back, back to the ethics discussion. And that's something we should always bear in our minds because if we take one step back, and front and two steps back, it won't work. We need to design and act responsibly on that direction. Last but not least is how we democratize the, the transformation, how we bring it to everyone. Actually, OECD has done some, some great research on that one, on how much impact we have on digital transformation to citizens. Businesses, they feel more, but the, the people they don't get it. Only, I think, 30%, if I was looking, the numbers of specific countries were feeling the impact of the digital transformation. And very few are measuring. Singapore is measuring diligently the impact to, to people. 
these three components are actually what leads us to, to digital leadership. That's what would take us forward and be the disruptive factor in the success and being able to follow the, the new era. I thank you so much for, for your time and uh, hopefully you have a great day here. Actually, it's a great day. <laughs> I was really impressed to be, to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pidis.